Hey, everybody. It's been two weeks, but we are back. Market Mavericks, Mike McGlow and Scott Melker. How are you guys doing? Glad to be good. back. Good, good. Yeah, it's good to get the team back together. Huh? Um, a little reunion tour. Now, um, let's start out. Let's get right into it. We're going to keep it to a crisp 30 minutes here. Uh, first off, we got PCE data this morning that basically came in 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 line with expectations. Mike, I would love to get your interpretation on that. Yeah, let's uh, let's show this on my screen. Um, I, I have a quick shot of what was expected. PC uh, year over year was expected. 3.1 came in 3%. Um, core was expected. 3.5 came in 3.5%. The bottom line is um, numbers are coming a little bit weaker than expected in terms of inflation. And what do you think happens in recessions? <laughs> Inflation goes down, um, and oftentimes, remember inflation way um, analysts were way behind the big spike in inflation to the peak, and now they're a little bit behind the the, the falling deflation, or I said disinflation, which is deflation in terms of PPI. PPI is negative four tenths. So, to me, this is the whole tilt towards pretty significant recession, way early days, and the market is just in that phase. Oh, it's great because the Fed's going to ease, but they're going to find out the hard way. The Fed's not going to ease with the ease they have in the past because of lessons of, inf of inflation. So, so if inflation numbers were slightly less than expected, meaning slightly lower, what's your take on the market? Is it that the market's just so overbought right now that the stock market's kind of neutral? Well, I think the S and P just went green, but, but we didn't get a, a rally like many people would have said, you know, or expected. And, and what's your take on that? Well, I like, it's a lesson I learned from farmers that uh, Scott's heard me say this when the, when the bulls get Turkey for Thanksgiving bears get it for Christmas. And I think that is the big, I knew that would bring out a smile, but you smile easily though. It, it, it's, it's a, um, it's, uh, it's kind of silly, but it makes sense in this sense, as we have this global recessionary tilt and there's still hopium from that equity market that, oh, the Fed's going to ease and save everybody. I'm a commodity guy and I see nothing but recession. I mean, gold's up to almost new highs. Energy prices are going down. Industrial metals prices are going down. Grains are going down. Bond yields are going down. The curve's inverted. And what's the Fed and all the central banks doing? Well, it's just a few months ago, they were hiking. Typically at this stage, for, to expect a bottom and recovery, you have to have a couple of years or at least a year after easing. We're not even there yet. So this to me is where we're getting towards the end of the year and we'll see how it does. But typically, you know, risk assets do well into Christmas rallies, but they already have. And I like to tilt back what we've been focusing on is um, TLT, you know, bonds. Uh, TLT mm -hmm. this month is up 11%. So it's beating the S&P 500 on a one year basis to today. The uh, gold is beating the S&P 500. It's up about 16%. The S&P 500 is up 15%. No one would have really thought that. But that's kind of what happens in recessions. And the key tilt is for next year's is I, the way I like to say it is I just publish my commodity outlook and everything's tilt and commodities are deflating. And the way I like to see it is they basically are dependent on that rising tide for the stock market to just stabilize. So that means the risk for me as we tilt towards next year is, to, is that TLT will be one of the best performers if we have just a little bit of a slight decline in the stock market, which means deflationary dominoes kicking in. So, so you said the magic word TLT, and every time we say TLT, I have to take a drink. So, uh, Scott, how's your TLT doing? You down with TLT? <laughs> yeah, you know me, right? I mean, uh, I think that uh, pretty happy. Obviously, you and I kind of started buying around 84, 85. I know you were sort of day trading it, and I said, listen, I'm establishing a long position here. My TLT view, much like Mike's, is that if we get a recession, which I do anticipate will come, how deep that goes, I don't know. TLT is going to blast off. We were rationally low, had a massive selling, bullish divergence with uh, RSI being oversold. All the things that I like to buy something. My cost basis around uh, 84, 85, obviously trading here 91.51. It is at resistance if you're a charting guy for TLT. Yeah. But really, my, my view here is much longer. I almost view this as a hedge, right? Uh, I'm not selling off uh, my equity portfolio that I've been investing in for all these years. It'll go down if there's a recession. So you got to be long something that's going to help you in that situation, right? So it's even less about making money necessarily in the short term on CLT than making sure I don't lose too much if uh, what we think happens does. Yeah, and I think I think what you're pointing out too, and, and I'm a I'm a technical guy, obviously, and just showing that chart, and you showed this trend line too. It's kind of beautiful in that 
you know, today we're getting a, a pullback in TLT. And if you look at that chart, you had that pivot low, which connects to this pivot low. And yesterday we hit resistance. So the chart was dictating a pullback on TLT. We're getting that. You know, my question to you guys would be like, all right, so the more I'm hearing out there, there's this there's this kind of hopium out there that's building that rates are going back to, you know, basically zero or close to you know, what's, what's the new normal? Like where does, when, when all is said and done and we get through, let's say the next 12 months, where are rates? Do you guys have like a, an idea? Yeah, well, I can, let me, get, let me address that one directly. You can see it on my screen is this is the outlook from Fed Fund of Futures. Rates right now are flat. We've showed this one before, uh, showing 5.33% expected by January of next year to drop to 4%. Um, that's pretty significant. I'm sorry, by December of 2024 to drop to 4.2%. Um, so that's a pretty significant drop. The market's expecting that. Um, so, okay, it's already priced in. Our bias is that's probably not going to happen because why should the Fed do anything? <laughs> and particularly because their inflation metrics are still well, well above those highs. But I want to tilt over to just a few screens that that's going to relate to what we were talking about earlier. So the market is expecting the rate hikes. Um, we were talking about TLT. What's this look about um, and TLT and, and gold, GLD? I want to point that out a little bit. This is just look at gold. Um, versus the S&P 500, it's been, um, S&P 500 has been kind of, you know, bouncing since this low versus gold, but gold versus S&P 500 is about flat and leading indicators are showing that gold should way outperform the S&P 500. This should tilt up, but I want to show you something related to TLT. If you take GLD, the biggest gold, the biggest commodity ETF on the planet, divide by TLT, you get this nice upward trending rally but i think what's going to happen next year is if we get a recession gld and tlt will both be best performers but tlt might be gold and this is what's happened mm -hmm. in the past we're so far stretched and one thing also showing this chart is this is 10-year yields if these 10-year yields are they spiked around that time five percent this is 30-year yield if it just drops a little bit which i think it will um, that's a major outperformance thing for TLT. So things, market's already priced for that. So, so the key T thing, I sorry, for TLT to outperform, you're basically saying rates are going to continue to drop, right? I mean, so, so are you thinking we're going to actually have def deflation potentially? Oh yeah. So that's why I'm, I'm thinking we're going to have pretty severe deflation. That's what I show you in this chart. I'm just pointing out if you take, um, take, let's just look at, the S&P 500, that's what I show you in orange. Take that divided by global GDP, nominal dollars, you go back uh, 60 years. Um, we are, st we're uh, in terms of G how expensive the US stock market is, it's basically at the same level as when it peaked in 2000 relative to GDP. So that's kind of the Warren Buffett model. So to me, what's going to happen is this is just a normal little reversion and that means uh, deflation, and I show you in terms of commodities, a good leading indicator for deflation. We had a bounce this year. This is commodities versus the same measure versus global G, uh, GDP. I'm showing this because I'm sure most of our users have never seen it. What is that tilt here? It's been trending down since the peak in 2008. It looks like we just had a bounce and heading back lower. What stops that normal trajectory for deflationary forces? Particularly, to me, the number one key is going to be if the stock market just says, oh, we can't hold up all the boats. We have to drop a little bit. That tilts everything downward. Interesting. Interesting. So, Scott, are you on that same page that we're headed for deflation? Like I've, I've honestly, and I'll just say my, my opinion real quick is I've been kind of stuck on this mantra that inflation is going to obviously come down, but it's going to struggle to get back in the box, right? Like Pandora's box was opened. Uh, and once it got above two, you know, because one of the things I'm thinking too, is if, if the economy gets bad and we see deflation, won't the fed just come out and print to oblivion again, and which will then cause inflation again, or am I wrong on this? Oh, well, we can't so, hear you, Scott. I would go to Mike on that one as well, to be quite honest. I mean, I'm somewhere in the middle, I think. You know, yeah. uh, I, it's it's hard uh, for me to make a wild prediction here as to which way it's going to go because I think everybody's effectively been wrong. I mean, Mike shows yeah. those Fed Fund Futures predictions. Those are great. But when was the last time that Fed Fund Future predictions were correct? I mean, seven or, eight months, seven or eight months ago, we were supposed to already be uh, three cuts into this cycle right now if you were following that same exact chart. So I really, you know, I, I don't think that I can outsmart it. I just know that whatever the consensus is has been consistently wrong and like exceptionally I, I think, and horribly wrong. 
I think this is a classic case of market cycles and human nature and people haven't figured out yet human nature never changed. And what's happened is we had a four decade high in inflation, most known because of the excess liquidity that we provided. And I would say central banks, the government, everything. That lesson has been learned. It will resonate for the rest of our lives. And every single time we get back to those normal conditions, where it's time for the Fed to start easing, they'll say, oh, we're going to lay low. We're not to ease until we absolutely have to, because the lessons that we learned here. Now, that was something that was that was working up for decades. I mean, the Fed started easy. I, I go. I like to check the show the history of every time the S and P 500 was down 20 percent or more on a 12 month basis since 1950 or so. The Fed was always easing, with one exception, 1988, because we just had the crash a year before. That's what's changed, and that's what I think the market hasn't figured out yet. And that's when I like to show charts like this. If you just look like this, this little um, little orange line, that's just how expensive the stock market is relative to global GDP historically. And that's part of the reason we had a lot of inflation, and we did that because we pumped money so supply so much. You think the Fed's stupid? No, they get it. This is finally our chance. Now we do have a election year, but right now with their metrics at three, four percent core levels. And the target at 2%, there's no reason to ease until the market makes them is the way I see it. Yeah, I think that that I think that's the thing where people seem to have some cognitive dissonance about what's going to happen next year. I hear the same people who are saying that, you know, there won't be a recession. Everything is great. Stocks are going to only continue up. But those same people are saying that the Fed's going to pivot. Why would the Fed pivot if stocks continue to go up? There's literally no reason, which gives you sort of this higher for longer or just the Fed pausing and waiting for more information. Now, you look at this. I've shared this a million times. But when consensus is a soft landing, that's the black line. The recession always comes right after, right? Now, give it. Yeah. There's a lot more media mentions in 2023 of anything than there were in the 1990s because we have uh, we're inundated with 24 yeah. seven media. So, the, you know, on a, on a, we need a long scale and not a linear scale for that black line. Mm-hmm. But I think it's very clear that that consensus soft landing uh, rarely happens. Like consensus, anything rarely happens. So uh, Mike's talked about TLT being a leader next year, uh, gold being a leader. Scott, where does Bitcoin fall into that group? Is it a leader or is it in the middle or is it a laggard? I think that uh, Bitcoin is going to do exceptionally well over the coming years. You know, and may- maybe I'm a uh, victim of my own having cycle belief and the four year cycle. But I-, I think, you know, listen, I think 38,000 here is a very, very natural. We can take a chart. Very, very natural uh, place for us to find significant resistance for this market to take a pause. If you take a look over here. Last time we were up at these prices, if you are wondering what was happening in April of May of 2022, well, Luna was about to happen in uh, April of May of 2022. So effectively getting back to 38,000 right now is erasing all the contagion of 2022, the collapse of all of these platforms. If you believe that price is, tells the entire story, I don't think we just blast through that right now, right? So like, I wouldn't be surprised certainly to see us at 40, 42, at kind of the same levels. I see a lot of people calling for 50, 55, 60 right now. That in my mind doesn't happen unless we get an outright and very clear ETF approval, I think. But I don't really see a reason for Bitcoin to be making new all-time highs this year, certainly, or through the next year, you know, to the end of 2024, 2025. But my fears of... 12,000, 15,000 new lows are pretty much erased at this point. Gotcha. Is there, so there was something, and I don't remember which big institution said it, whether it was Morgan Stanley or something else, but one of them came out and said that the ETF approval might actually be something that causes selling in Bitcoin. Is that is there any truth? Do you guys see any aspect I think so. of that? Well, I, I think it would be one of those uh, up big, then profit taking down and then wait a few months and see what actually happens fundamentally with the ETF and how much interest there is. We've seen this with a number of things before. I think actually the having is probably the best example of what might happen when we see an ETF. Obviously, obviously you get the having happens. Everybody celebrates that you pop off the streamers and the champagne and then you go, wait, nothing happens. Right. right, because nothing fundamentally has happened. Yes, the new supply is going to be cut in half, but it takes six, eight, nine months for that to have any effect on the market. And I, and I think you know, I don't think we just see twenty billion dollars or fifty billion dollars flow into an ETF because it exists the minute that it happens. But I do think that happens over six months to a year, and that's when we really start to see this fundamental vision. Also, there's the unlock of GBTC that would come with that, with, that could put uh, selling pressure on the market, but. Every single time in the history of crypto that I've heard the holy crap, 
there's a huge amount of supply of something coming on the market they're all going to sell. It's literally never happened, ever, yeah. in history. I, I just I want to add a little bit to that. Um, one thing I, I'll point out my main concerns about. Bitcoin fact is a high beta asset. Bitcoin fact has a high positive beta to, um, it's a high volatility asset to beta, which is the S&P 500. Um, typically on, on downward markets. So let's put, look at 20, 2022. Bitcoin went down than most, most risk assets as it went down. This year, Bitcoin's going up with most assets as they've gone up. If I'm right about a typical recession, that means gold and bonds outperform. In the shorter term, it's unlikely to expect Bitcoin to outperform on the way up in that environment. To, for that beta just to switch positive, to switch to flip to negative versus a downward sloping market. It's just the way value at risk and risk models work. And one thing I want to show you in my, my chart is the thing I'm concerned about is what you see in that orange line. That's again, that's the US stock market relative to global GDP. If you take all the rest of the world stocks relative to GDP, this is what you have since 1991. That's how much privilege we have, how much risk, how much asset elevation we have in this country. That's in housing, that's in stocks. And what I also show you is just um, here is just the energy is already starting to head lower. That's your deflationary bent. But this is what I'm worried about. This has already started a little bit. If we continue that, that's deflation. I think that helps the traditional store value uh, risk off assets, but to expect Bitcoin, it, let's put it this way, it hasn't shown that divergent strength with stock weakness yet in a big picture. And this year's another good example. GBTC is what, a great performing asset this year. That's the problem for next year is it was the top line performer this year. Is it going to do the same next year? Ah, we already kind of did that. Mike, you did point yeah. out, well, just so quickly, you did point out the fact that gold now, if depending on the time frame you look at that, is somewhat outperformed stocks. Right? Yeah, it is. It's, it's outperforming. So, so to me, that's that leading bent. Right. So then the question that we always debate on Mondays, of course, becomes is Bitcoin gold or is Bitcoin stock and a risk asset? But the fact is that if you're looking at the market right now, all of them have gone up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Except for bonds. And but what's starting to go up now? Bond prices. Bonds. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting that bonds are going up. Stocks still seemingly going up. Gold still going up. It seems like uh, there's something strange afoot. Yeah, yeah we'll see what's going to happen okay. next year. <laughs> and I think that's that's kind of one of the si the angles I wanted to talk to you about, Mike. Is that you know we've seen this pretty remarkable rally to the point where you know the volume has died out over the last couple of weeks. The market just seems to grind up. Today we saw the S and P selling off. Now it's kind of floated back back up um, to basically the flat line. But the question that I have is is does that continue into year end or do we see, I mean, like what's got to give here? There's got to be something, right? I don't think Bitcoin can go keep going up and, and gold can keep going up and stocks can keep going up. At some point, some of these assets have to diverge, right? So here, here's what I'm showing. I'm just showing the simple chart of S&P 500 divided by gold. My macro outlook is I think it's time to sell gold and, and to lighten up in gold and, and buy stocks when we go back to one-to-one -one parity. And I should say, maybe I should say if, and that's what I think we're going. So in a normal recession, now if we can get through the next few months, certainly through next year without a recession, okay, then I'll be wrong and you have to buy high, sell higher. That's a good problem to have for everyone. But they, that's why I like to point out the macro is, yes, Bitcoin's a revolutionary asset, but um, we have to see, this is what's happening globally. China is severely heading towards a property crisis as bad as Japan 30 years ago, bad as the U.S. 2008, and potentially peaking like the Soviet Union. Europe is already in a recession, yet they just were tightening just a few months ago. Global GDP is negative, PMIs are negative, retail sales are negative. U.S. retail sales divided by CPI are negative. There's so many, the last durable goods order or number for October was the worst since October of 2008. I mean, these things are just starting to trickle down. I think what's happening right now is the stock market still has that hopium that it's different this time and we'll be fine. It's gonna be a soft, soft landings priced in and the Fed's just gonna ease and save us like they have in the past. This is what I'm pointing out is they won't do that. And that's why I'm really worried about Bitcoin and think it's better off like we've been pointing out those two notes were great at 5%, not 4.73%, they're not so great, but still that's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a, a giant black hole for risk assets. Can I float a theory, Gareth? Yes, please. That's coming in, in my mind right now. We, we continually, continually argue whether Bitcoin is gold or whether Bitcoin is a risk asset. What if Bitcoin is just Bitcoin and it's neither? And because of the fundamental underpinnings of news like a Bitcoin spot ETF, 
maybe it's just uncorrelated and traveling its own path and it's not going to matter as much what the macro does uh, for Bitcoin. I mean, we're talking about a market cap of 1.4 trillion total for crypto. And that's with, I don't know, 279,000, oh wait, 280,000 since we started talking <laughs> coins, right? And Bitcoin itself only has a market cap of 739 billion. I do think that it's small enough before it becomes fully financialized and a part of Wall Street. I do think that it's small enough that a big piece of news could completely untether it from either of those things, depending on what the market does and when that timing comes in. I saw someone in the comments, they asked a great comment. Do you think the ETF would further financialize Bitcoin and there will be more shorts? Institutions will get exposure oh, yeah. to play with it. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a valid concern. That's the reason that we saw the futures ETF launch be a top. That's the reason that we saw CME futures launching be the dead top to the day of the 2017 Bitcoin top. But mm -hmm. as a aside, I would say that any institution that wants to short Bitcoin has found a way. So I, I think there's people waiting for the ETF to short. Uh, I agree with you. And I've known people doing it and doing pretty well. I mean, that short, yeah. some of the options in short bit have been great versus the underlying versus great. The great trade this year has been that similar and GBTC. But the, the, um, the, the bottom line, I think, for this is it's something that's completely obvious and simple to predict. And we've been pointing out for years is expect Bitcoin the best days of Bitcoin performance are absolutely over. Expect volatility to continue to decline versus all risk assets as it comes into the mainstream, as ETFs proliferate. The performance will be much less than it has in the past. It'll be much more of a normal trading asset. But remember, this is going into the mainstream now. <laughs> it's just welcome. But sorry, that's the one thing I like to point out. People who've done very well in Bitcoin and bought it when everybody else said not to buy it and it's stupid internet money. Now, if you're buying it, because I just see a, an ad right on night right now, CNBC that says Bitto and CNC, CN, CNN. Just I saw GPTC. I mean, it's it's so mainstream now. It's like, yes. OK, well, great. But you know, I mean, that works for the stock market and Apple and Amazon for a while. But at some point, you're just part of the mainstream now. I think Bitto hit a uh, all time high in AUM today, by the way, uh, 1.4, 1.5 billion, yeah. something like that. And uh, the Canadian ones actually have more AUM even than that, which is spot, but uh, a bit surprising. But you can see that there's definitely a thirst right now for for the Bitcoin spot ETF will get approved trade, because that's the only reason people are buying a futures ETF today, right? right? And we saw Michael Saylor. I mean, it was announced that he would. How many did he buy? Another sixteen thousand for MicroStrategy. A Something cool like sixteen thousand. I mean, you know. imagine just like casually. I think Rand said earlier this was his you know, third or fourth. Maybe it was his fourth largest Bitcoin purchase ever in dollar terms. Wow, yeah, he's really, really at getting after it. He is certainly. So let me ask you a question on this. And this is something I was wondering about the institutional uh, institutions with regards to the ETFs. Is is Michael Saylor buying directly on the open market or is he going directly to the miners to get these this amount? Because that's what I was wondering is like, that's a that's a lot of coins where, you know, is he, I think is they he buy, I, I think he laid out early. I don't know if it's still the same, but in the early days when he was buying en masse, he actually laid out the strategy that they had for very small purchases uh, on Coinbase. Uh, originally, at least he had said that that's how they're doing it. I don't know if they're going directly to miners. Now, there's been a lot of conjecture from Plan B and some other accounts. I saw that uh, BlackRock is currently buying a ton of Bitcoin directly from miners. And that's why we're seeing hash rate mooning and going to the, you know, and, and with price not following in the same way, right? Yep. If you look at the historical relationship between hash rate and price, Bitcoin price right now should be 55, 56, 58,000. I did not mean to have a Richard Hart there on the bottom when I showed the uh, Michael <laughs> Saylor tweet, but but there you go. Yeah, 16,000 Bitcoin. But uh, I, I don't think that that's really the case or what's driving hash rate at the moment. I just think we're, we're coming into the halving and it's just uh, that that part of the cycle. But uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, that micro strategy buys directly on Coinbase. They just do it a very little bit at a time. They have a strategy. Uh, and I think that miners who need to sell uh, have plenty of willing buyers at the moment. So quick question on my side, um, when it comes to the Fed speakers, so this week, one of the things that kind of irked me and, um, you know, it, it, there was something like 10 or 15 Fed speakers this week. And we also have Jerome Powell speaking tomorrow. And on Tuesday, you know, I think Fed Waller, who's like a hawk, he was more dovish. Markets liked it. Then we had a couple other Fed players yesterday and today causing some more hawkish views. Like, what's the purpose of 
all of these speeches? Like, why do Fed t- 10 Fed officials in one week need to speak? Because all it does is mess with people, right? I mean, you know, what's what's going on here? Like, what's their mandate? Do they need to feel big because they can move the markets? So that's that's part of um, I, I want to address that because I was working for primary dealers, which your job is to understand and know the Fed starting in 1988. And the lesson back then you learn is we had to interpret Fed signals from their open market operations. And what's changed is the market realized and the Fed realized it's probably best to be open, uh, completely open with what we do and what we're planning on doing. So but particularly, particularly when you hear them speak, they almost all have the same coordinated view. Um, I just look. I just typed an NI Fed in the terminal, and I think right, and it says Fed Williams expects policy to stay restrictive for some time. That's the top headline I see right on the Bloomberg terminal when you type in Fed. So these guys are mostly the same. There's been a few said they might ease, but it's rare to see them diverge. Um, and that's what they have been. It's the higher for longer mantra that I think you're going to hear. Although the market's well priced for easing, like some of them are within a few months. But if and, they're all saying, if they're all saying generally the same thing, and I, I thought Waller on Tuesday was he was he's usually the super hawk, and he was like, hey, if if inflation comes down more, we can start cutting rates, you know, next year essentially. But like, if, yeah. even if they're all the same, what's the purpose? I mean, you know, are they just is this are these pre slated speeches, or are they planning these speeches, or or like, do you know those details? I, I don't know for sure, but I think there's some planning to it. The goal always is to minimize volatility and to make sure um, to not upset market expectations. And that's why it usually happens. When you see um, that Fed fund futures are priced for a hike or a cut at 100%, like a week before a meeting, they hardly ever diverge from that. Right. And they true. guide it. And that's a big difference from the past. They will guide the market's intent. And the bottom line is always to minimize market volatility. Yeah. Okay. I see what you're saying. Absolutely. All right. No, that's a good point. What else do you guys have on the docket? We got a couple minutes left. Is there anything you guys been dying to bring up? Yeah. Share my screen. I got one more thing. We got to talk about Joe Biden. I'm sorry. (laughs) Let me be clear to any corporation that hasn't brought their prices back down, even as inflation has come down, it's time to stop the price gouging. Give American consumers a break. First of all, I don't think he knows what X or Twitter (laughs) is. So I'm sure this is like the social media intern. Eric Voorhees right there in the comments wants to say exactly what I want to say. Inflation rate is still positive, so why would prices prices come down, you dummy? But Mike, can you explain to Joe Biden how inflation and deflation work by any chance? Well, I, I like to point out is we are not a socialist country; we are a capitalist country. And if you are a if you are any type of business, you're supposed to mac- maximize profit. If you're not, you're going to go out of business. That's the way life works. Just sorry, that's how we work. We are not Mr. Z or not um, Venezuela. I mean, it just doesn't work. So I, I, I know when it kind of gets me upset sometimes when people say those kind of things just for clicks and for votes, but it's really distorting the whole essence of the foundation of this country, which is why we're so successful. Um, yeah, and yes, we have losers and winners. Right. But, I, I didn't yeah, mean to I, go political. It's just such but, a colorblind and also just yeah, like factually but in the, in, incorrect and impossible tweet that it has to be mentioned right. because this is what people yeah. read. Prices, you know, again, but the, the, damn you companies. Is, it's free at, at the, the best thing or, we, yeah. well the best thing is let free markets do that and that's what's happening For inflation by some measures is collapsing as long as free mar- as, as long as free markets are allowed to they will the biggest problem is if the government just throws a whole bunch more money at it and and pumps up that liquidity that's the number one reason we had that inflation the government shut us down and then threw money at us um, and what, it was a, a problem I guess but now we're getting we're, we're re- realizing that that sugar high is not going to be that easy. We just love, I mean, they, we just love to blame corporations, billionaires, uh, capitalism for all of our problems. As if the government had That's nothing politically to do with it. The, the But just to be clear, Joe, if you have any inflation, prices are going up. Still They're up. inflating yeah. by definition. We Mike, you had something you were going to bring up. For... I didn't mean to jump in ahead of Mike's last thoughts there. No, no, but I think that's important for people to recognize. And and so, you know, if anything, we can call it out. And I don't think either any of us here care if it's a Democrat, Republican, or, a, you know, yeah, not, a, a bird in the sky. It, it, we're going to call it out. And, it, and it's important to recognize that in, it would have to be deflation right now for prices to technically come down. Now, it doesn't right. mean, by the way, and this is what Mike's getting at, is that, you know, competition is really the best factor that draws prices lower. So as long as there's competition, if companies have room to lower prices, they will. It's just, you know, in realistic terms, inflation is still here and we still have inflation. 
So that's the, uh, the what the farmers teach us, the high price cure, which I show you in my chart. This was, I published my 2024 commodity outlook. I'm all macro, and that's what I point out is, to me, the biggest issue for next year, when we're having this conversation next year, is we'll be talking about infla deflation, I fully expect, particularly if the stock market doesn't keep that plateau higher. If the stock market just wobbles a little, let's say 10% after rallying, 20% this year, that is a severe deflationary force kicking in. And it's just yeah. typically normal after the biggest pump in liquidity ever. Now, you're already seeing it in commodities. That's why I'm showing this chart versus GDP. This little thing, this mean, mean reverting, which is well above where it was at the peak in 2000. Remember, we had that pretty good recession into the bottom in 2002. We're right about that level in terms of the elevation, the relative value of the U.S. stock market versus the rest of the world. So to me, that's the big problem. And maybe that's why the Martin, the Fed is starting to kind of point out we will ease if we have to, because I think, think they're starting to see some of the data I, I have. And that is unemployment is our target next year is around 5%, which is a almost significant recession after bottom at 3.4%. That's Bloomberg Economics. Wow. I mean, the one thing I'll say, and again, this is probably one of the few areas that we differ, Mike, is that for me, it's very hard to imagine real deflation because I just see like, you know, the Fed is just waiting to lower those rates, waiting to free up money. And, and the government is just wanting to spend more and more. And so it's just hard to hard for me to imagine how if, if we do see deflation, then the guns come out again and the, the money starts getting printed like crazy. But but I mean, in a weird way, I would love to see prices come down like Biden is insinuating and people could actually get cheaper goods. <laughs> uh, it will. Deflation is the worst. And, and I, I mean, it's already happening in China's pretty significantly in deflation at the moment. The government is doing what they can to help, but there's not much more they can do without cl um, collapsing their currency. I view it as very similar to the 1930s. What completely bottomed the stock market and bottomed the deflation process is when we debase a currency versus gold. I mean, we dropped, yeah. it was like 50%. Now that ended it, but we don't want to get there. The point is the tilt is that way right now. The Fed hasn't started easing. They might. and But we're not going to see anywhere near the fiscal and monetary stimulus we saw. And that's a key thing. Remember what happened this year. We've bounced. The wealth effect is still there. But we've created the most significant. We've done it on the most significant jump in debt to GDP outside of recession of, of, or war ever. So we're doing it on borrowed money. And it's just almost always the way it goes. The key thing to remember is it's the base. So I'll just give you an example of CPIs based on the owner's equivalent when is rent is the biggest part of CPI, which is part of from a price of a home. So the price of an average home in this country has doubled in the last 10 years, about that, if you look at the FHFA value. So once you get to that high, high level, which is what, five to 600,000, you measure from that level, that's deflation. So let's say we go down to 400,000 or so, do what we just did from 2006 to 2011, it was deflationary. The key difference is from all times in the past is um, the lessons of the Fed easing too much and the inflation they created. Gotcha. All right, Scott, what else do you, anything else on your docket here? That's it. I think we covered it all. I mean, <laughs> went three minutes over, you know, we're because it's that good stuff man i think people appreciate it all right guys um make sure to follow each of these gentlemen you see the their socials below um i thank you guys for coming on i think it's it's uh it's a useful realization and, and just just honest stream so thank you guys for watching market mavericks with us and uh thank you mike and thank you scott and uh, we'll look forward to next thursday thank you man